Today is Wednesday, August 13, 2014, the 225th day of the year. There are 140 days remaining until the end of 2014. Born this day in 1860, Annie Oakley, American target shooter. Oakley is the first American woman superstar, famous throughout America and Europe for her sharpshooting rifle skills, which she refines as a young girl hunting small game for her family, a practice she begins with a clean shot straight through the head of a squirrel who makes the fatal mistake of stopping for a few seconds to pick up a hickory nut just yonder to the fence. Line. The girl is eight years old, a natural. She sells game to her neighbors in Greenville, Ohio, also to local restaurants and hotels. By the time she's 15, she pays off the mortgage on her mother's farm with hunting and trapping profits. You got to use what you got to get just what you want. In that same year, 1875, the traveling dog trainer and trick shooter Frank Butler makes a $100 bet with Cincinnati hotel owner Jack Frost that he can beat any local fancy shooter. The prize is worth more than $2,000 in today's money. The hotel guy arranges a match with a striking 15-year-old Annie Oakley, full-grown by then, barely five feet tall, but a kid with a reputation as a dead shot. The match on Thanksgiving Day 1875 goes 25 rounds. Butler misses that 25th shot, and he knows how that squirrel at the fence line with the hickory nut in its mouth must have felt. He's never seen anybody shoot like that. A year later, they're working circuses together. The act is a solid head with rubes coming in from miles around to see this little woman's trick shooting. Butler claims the date of their marriage is June 20, 1882, when she's a respectable 22 and he's 30, only a few years older, but other sources show the two kids married earlier when Oakley was barely 15, and Butler, a man grown of 23 years. He's Irish, hot-blooded. She likes that. Years later, during the 1890-91 season when Annie Oakley is a headliner with Buffalo Bill's Wild West, the troupe travels abroad, performing for the crowned heads of Europe, among other old country rubes. In Germany, the young future Kaiser Wilhelm II, then the crown prince, is so impressed with Oakley's skill he volunteers to be a dummy in her act, and she shoots the ash off his cigarette at 90 paces. Oakley, perhaps a touch nervous, places the cigarette in his hand, not in his mouth. Smart. With Butler, she shoots the cigarette right off his face. Butler, she knows, doesn't flinch, and by then she's so popular she can always easily find another husband. The Kaiser, his grit is untested. Local fools later suggest if she hadn't been quite so accurate, she could have prevented World War I. When the war does break out during the second decade of the 20th century, a hundred years ago, Oakley writes to her pal, the Kaiser, requesting... A second shot. Impertinent? Yes. Documented truth? Not really. It's a good story, though. The Kaiser, doubtless occupied with the war on the Western Front, doesn't answer. Born this day in 1926, Fidel Alejandro Castro Ruz, Cuban lawyer, politician, 15th president of Cuba. El Presidente, El Cabron, El Jefe, El Caballo. He's got a lot of nicknames. Son of a successful sugar planter and his servant mistress, though, to be fair, they eventually marry, and Fidel, one of seven children born to that union, becomes interested in anti-imperialist Marxism as a law student at the University of Havana, with a minor in practical gangster culture in Havana's thriving underground, where it's rumored he develops skills as an assassin. In 1947, school's out. Fidel travels to the Dominican Republic to join the rebellion against right-wing junta leader Rafael Trujillo, also coincidentally known as El Jefe and chapitas, which translates to bottle caps because he likes to wear a lot of military medals. El Chivo, the goat, possibly because of his affection for young prostitutes. Trujillo, our man in the Caribbean, never encountered a box of money he wouldn't accept, who is eventually, in 1961, bumped off while tooling around the countryside outside the capital in his Chevrolet Bel Air. Castro sees himself as the heir to Cuban independence leader Jose Marti and leads guerrilla war against the government of Jorgencio Batista, also a big fan of money boxes, either from the United States government or from the Mafia, which has succeeded in turning Havana into the Las Vegas of the Caribbean. Hotels, casinos, cheap buffet tables, a money machine. The U.S. is worried that Castro is getting too close to the capital. Batista sees the wisdom of getting out of town with his limbs still attached to his body, which a lot of dictators seem not to understand. Gaddafi, for example, might be living the high life in the south of France if he hadn't stuck around Libya when things got hot there. Batista, arguably smarter, gets away on December 31, 1958, into exile with 300 million in U.S. dollars. This uh, is depicted in that great scene in Godfather 2 when Michael tells Fredo he knows Fredo lied about knowing Johnny Ola, that it was Fredo who enabled that failed attack at Lake Tahoe. How did Fredo get back to the U.S.? Did he swim to Miami? Castro and his revolutionary army turned out to be America's worst nightmare. 
He nationalizes Cuba's industry, the sugar, the tobacco, energy production, and he chases the mafia back to New York and Chicago. Since 1960, hundreds of attempts are made by the American CIA, by elements of organized crime, even by Castro's girlfriends, to get rid of him. The poisoned wetsuit, the depilatory in his shoes, the exploding seashells, the LSD in his radio studio. But Castro holds on to power in Cuba for 65 years. When his girlfriend, Marita Lorenz, smuggles a jar of cold cream laced with poison pills into Castro's bathroom at the behest of the CIA, maybe it's his bedroom. Another brilliant idea, and he finds out about it. He hands her a loaded pistol and tears open the front of his shirt. Okay, I made that part up. But the point is, the poor woman can't do it. The weapon in her hands, the opportunity right there in front of her, the big box of Yankee dollars waiting for her in the sedan outside. Okay, I made that part up too. She can't shoot him. You can guess what happens to her. Too bad, nice girl. Castro says, if surviving assassination attempts were an Olympic event, I would win the gold medal. The singer and songwriter Jim Morrison says, the most important kind of freedom is to be what you really are. There can't be any large-scale revolution until there's a personal revolution on an individual level. It's got to happen inside first. From Rutland, Vermont, this is Richard Alcott speaking.